decided to do, instead of just making the wine and uh, proceeding with the South Dakota wine, uh, we decided that it's pretty tough to beat California at what they do. And so we decided to uh, move into vinegars because vinegars is a, a more unique uh, growing niche because if you have a microscopic niche, anything is growing. What, what I do and what we do, we have 20 employees that work both of these buildings, is uh, we sell directly to the chefs nationwide. And so we have about 1,200 customers, and they're all, 90% of them are tablecloth restaurants. Uh, so if you give me a, a locale in western U.S., I can tell you the restaurants, the chef names, and what they order. Uh, and it's, uh, it's been a love of mine uh, for 31 years. And so knowing the specialty food market, knowing what's happening in the culinary scene, uh, we decided to go ahead and go into the vinegars. romantic style that I was talking about before, it's called old world style if you looked it up on Google. And basically you're just putting the grape juice in. If you have enough courage, you can actually put um, some of the grapes, not just the juice. And it adds depth, but it also increases your chance of mold. So that's kind of one of the issues you balance. Um, most vinegar makers keep it between um, 76 and 80 degrees. And we experimented with keeping it at a lower temperature, thinking that it would be a smoother vinegar if it took a longer time to process. And what we learned is that the acidobacters that are what are converting the juice into the alcohol and into the vinegar don't do a thing unless you're right around that 80 degrees. And so if, after we learned that and learned that you know the slow, colder temperatures weren't going to do a thing for us, um, then we started keeping it at exactly 80 degrees, and it was exactly you know, three and a half months to four months of just the product sitting there. Um, and then you had full conversion, and then we'd put it in large vessels, and we're um, aging it for two years. So now the 2012 is ready to be bottled and start selling at this point is where we're at. But it was a really neat learning curve for me, and we'll pass these around, but... On top of the juice, you get a mother, and that's the um, cellulose from the conversion process. And at first, it's pretty frightful because you're looking at this, and it's, you'll see in a photo over on the wall. I mean, it is just mushy, and um, Lawrence Diggs, who's um, a vinegar maker in South Dakota on the east side of the state, um, said, well, you'll get used to knowing if it's a good mother or a bad mother. And I thought, are you crazy? But it's true. And so after my mothers um, are done doing their thing, I dry them because I'm so intrigued by the mothers. And we'll pass these around, but you can totally tell that this was a good mother. And it, she's thin and smooth. And then this was a not so good mother. And so this probably made a vinegar that wasn't even worthy of keeping. So, and then with the white grapes, this was a very thin, light mother, and so she made good, um, good vinegar. Number one thing with great harvest is everything we do is guaranteed. If we miss the steak size, we have FedEx pick it up, and FedEx delivers the next day the, the correct product. And so they know that's the guarantee. They know that, uh, um, there's a chef language that you can speak, and, and in being able to do that and give them the nuances of the different vinegars, they then can incorporate it into a recipe, uh, for even for a green bean, something like that. Uh, even for a souffle, they can do that. Um, and so it's a trust and communication and, number one, samples. Um, every time I travel, uh, we have samples. 